Hello, everyone. I see folks are joining in. We're going to take a minute or two and let all of the attendees get into the webinar. And um, in about a minute or two, we'll start the introduction and, and hear from Judge Abby. So thanks for being here today. Okay, it looks like the attendees have settled down. So I think we have everyone. Is, is everyone able to hear me? Megan, if you are there, I think we need you to put us in speaker view. All right, so. Thank you everyone for coming today. My name is Stephanie Lane and I'm the Director of, Arum of Alumni Relations at Humboldt and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this special event, our very first ever Virtual Distinguished Alumni Award Speaker Series um, where we're honoring Abby Abagnani and she is commonly known as Judge Abby. So that's how we will refer to her um, for the rest of the day. And she is one of our 2020 Distinguished Alumni Award recipients. So throughout this webinar, please feel free to submit any questions you have for Abby through the Q&A feature. And we'll be sure to get those um, uh, to her at the end of her speaking time. So for those of you who don't know, Humboldt State has been recognizing the achievements of our alumni since 1960 when it launched its annual Who's Who's Award. Distinguished alumni are individuals recognized as leaders in their fields or outstanding contributors to their community, nation, or Humboldt State. And I'm sure you'll see that Abby is definitely fits that description. Each year, the Office of Alumni Relations receives many nominations for Distinguished Alumni Awards, and it's always a very tough decision. There's a committee of former Alumni Award winners and HSU staff that review the nominations and select those most deserving of the honor. Judge Abby is absolutely no exception. She graduated from HSU in 1970 with a degree in journalism and went on to earn her Juris Doctorate degree from the University of New Mexico. She is the chief judge for the Yurok tribe where she is an enrolled member. She is the first Native American woman to pass the California bar. She also serves as the court commissioner for the city and county of San Francisco, a position she's held for 20 years. Abby has taught in numerous law schools, including the University of California, Berkeley and Stanford University Law School. Abby is one of a growing number of tribal judges nationwide incorporating traditional culture into their courtrooms with the dual aim of rehabilitating individuals and providing justice to people often failed by the regular criminal justice system, which I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about today. Abby, at this time, I would love to present to you your Distinguished Award plaque. And let me just make sure, can everybody see that? There you go. We have a local artist here, yay, who makes these. This is a beautiful redwood slab um, made locally from Humboldt to you that you can add to that collection of wonderful awards you have on your wall already. <laughs> so, Without further ado, we um, would like to make sure that everyone knows the, the award winners, we have them come back to campus typically and do a, a talk to be able to incorporate and, ins and inspire current students, alumni, faculty, staff, and our community members. So thank you all for being here and being a part of that, that crowd who will get to hear her story. Um, Abby's talk today is titled, An Apology and Request for Value-Based Practices. So Abby, thank you so much for being here today. I'll mute myself and the screen is all yours. All right. 
Thank you very much. And I appreciate everyone who has signed up and is listening. Um, I'm sorry that we aren't engaged in more of a conversation, but uh, I do have a few things I, I wanted to put out for you to think about. Um, the first thing I, I wanted to say is uh, in terms of what, how I fashion my, my thinking about this is that I'm very pleased to, to receive the award, but I'm also very concerned about a couple of things. And one of them is that I know um, that part of my responsibility um, as, as a human and as somebody who is getting older and older, as we say, was to try to, to make change and to try to do something that would help you and help younger people. And when I look around and I go, wow, this world might actually be a bigger mess than when I came into it. And I never meant for that to happen. Um, and I've tried very hard. And I'm just at this point in my life trying to think of, you know, what could I have or should I have done maybe a little differently. And to look back on that and to maybe help you in your thinking, one of the things that um, I think about quite a bit is that as a tribe, especially the tribes in the north, and, and if you look at all of the sort of history and historical issues around the tribes in the north, we ended up having to, for the, a large part, having to run and hide in order to survive. And that was essential, and we needed to do it, and we did it. And because of that, uh, some of us survived. And for the Yurok's, we're the largest surviving tribe in the state. But that time has come and gone. And now is a time when we need to have more of a partnership and be more in community with the people who are around us. And I guess that's my message now, is to say, yes, we need a lot of attention to things at home, but we also have things that we could have and should have shared and maybe would have prevented some of the chaos that we're all experiencing now. And that's, that's the apology and that's what I wanna concentrate on today is that value system. And the thing about practices is that they're, they're all pretty much value driven. And when, during the introduction, there was a little discussion about you know, bringing culture into the courtroom and those kinds of things, but it's really about bringing values into the courtroom. And if you look at what you're familiar with in terms of a judicial system, because that's where I've worked for, for most of my life is in a judicial system, and you look at that and you go, okay, here's the values of this judicial system and here's the values of this particular culture. The values of the state system are that you have rights and you have rights to this. You have a right to remain silent. You have a right to have an attorney. You have a right to a trial. You have all these different rights. Culturally for us, we didn't have as many rights at all. We had a lot of responsibilities and responsibilities are a lot different than rights. And those responsibilities are interlocking and interrelated so that you have a responsibility in community uh, for the community, for yourself, for your family. And if you're not meeting those responsibilities, then they're not getting, get, getting taken care of. And that's more of what I'm trying to say at this point is that maybe if we had worked a little more on that message and we had shown that to other people, things could have uh, worked out better for everyone. And I'll give you an example of that. We now have in Humboldt and Del Norte, um, as opposed to the rest of the country at this point, joint jurisdiction courts. And those courts have um, state court judge, a state court judge, and a tribal court judge dealing with welfare and institution code violations. And the purpose of those courts is to work together to resolve the problem that brought the families into these courts. Now that's a whole different approach than going, okay, what's your right? You know, you have a right to do this or you not do this. What we're trying to do is set up a system that says, look, you know when things aren't going well for you. This is not a huge surprise. And maybe if you felt able to come to us and say, I had a problem and I need you to help me resolve that problem. 
because everybody at some point is going to need to be able to do that because you know you know how it is some days are better than others and you go through periods when life is difficult and you need assistance and if the systems are based on that and if you realize okay well we have a responsibility to each other then you build institutions that reflect that as opposed to we'll help you if we prove you guilty and provide a consequence well i don't know if that's really helping anybody providing a consequence and that's something that you have to look at and this particular culture that i'm talking about what's interesting to me as as you look at other cultures is that it's not that unique you know the this country might be more unique in the sense of providing consequences instead of being helpful or having relationships you know when people came to this country um, others besides us there was a whole big push about okay you're now um, in order to come into this country you're going to be thrown into the melting pot which means you're going to give up your culture you're going to have this as a value and these are our values and this is how you're going to go forward well that what i'm saying to you is that might have been a mistake you know and it might be one of those things that we need to look at and go you know what on second thought we don't want you to forget about your culture we want you to have a systematic way in your mind of thinking about resolution of problems and maybe the one we set up is not the best one because if you look at a lot of our institutions right now they're not working very well they're not actually resolving problems uh, to a certain extent they're creating problems you have a lot of disparity in them you have a lot of people who are being victimized by what are supposed to have been envisioned as helping institutions because were they really helping institutions or are they just a way to, to create an imbalance in power and that's kind of what what we ended up with and systemic issues are different than say here's here's this problem let's solve this problem well this problem may be a result of this system as opposed to this behavior that you're seeing as the end result you know and for us what we've spent a lot of time doing in in our court is looking at wellness courts as opposed to creating a system that is a mirror of the system that you're used to because what we're really trying to do is say look you need to come back into into relationship in community that's supported in community and do your part because if you don't do your part, we can't move forward, you know, and it's sort of like in many ways, you know, leave no person behind or whatever. Um, if you have these things and you can share and you can move ahead, uh, you're going to take care of each other. You're going to take care of the environment and it changes your approach. And that's, that's more of a value based system or at least a value based system that, that I want to live in. You know, and you have to figure out what what your values are and how that works. And part of what you're learning now, you know, in school, I mean, I went to school admittedly a very long time ago, but you do learn at a certain point, okay, this is how you should do it. And what I'm saying to you at this point is that much of education is presented as if this is a definition of how you should do it. Well, no, it is not the definition. It is a definition. And you can change that definition. And you have to figure out <coughs> how you do that and when you do that. And I'll give you an example. When I was still on the bench in San Francisco, and I, I have retired from there, at one point we had to do a training about security in the courtroom. And I had missed it because I was off doing something, I don't recall what. And so I had to make up the training. And so I had made up the training and a big part of the training was, okay, if there's an incident in the courtroom, the bailiff's primary responsibility at that time was to make sure that the judge was safe. And so I went to my um, superior judge after the, the training and said, you know, I, I really can't do what was asked in that training. And he said, 
well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I am not going to leave a courtroom full of children, possibly elders and other people I'm responsible for and save myself first. It's just not who I am and it's not what I'm about. And I don't agree with that philosophically. And if I ran out to save myself, I'd have no place to go because I'd be too embarrassed to show my face anywhere. It's just not how it works. So then we proceeded to have a whole discussion and or argument, depending on how you want to phrase it. And finally, in the end, he just said, well, let's just hope it never happens in your courtroom. And I said, you know what? I can live with that. And we just left it at that. But there are certain points where you have to go, no, I get what you're saying to me, but I'm not going to do it. And this is how we're going to do it instead. You know, and that's what I mean by value-based practices. So you change, your values change what, what the practice is because it's just something that I personally couldn't or wouldn't tolerate. So you have to be secure in that and you have to look at your education in that way because they have a role, education does have a role, but you have to be able to question that and be able to go, okay, that may work in this situation but that's not how I'm going to do it. And when you design programs or when you design solutions or when you look at something, you go, okay, I want to figure out how I'm going to work that out. How are we going to do that? You know, and an example, institutionally, we were talking um, before this began about the missing and murdered uh, Indian women and how there's a lot of discussion now about the disparities that exist and the numbers that exist and how high the numbers are in California is like fifth in the nation for missing and murdered Indian women and Northern California accounts for about a third of those. And you go, you know, that's, that's not okay. And so how are we gonna address that? You know, that's a systemic issue. And you start gathering your data and figuring out how did this happen and what are we gonna have to do? One, to resolve some of those cases and two, to ensure that doesn't happen in the future. And that's what you know your education can bring to light is, okay, we're gonna gather the information and then we're gonna figure out how to put an end to this because that's not okay. Because the grief of that um, carries on generation to generation. You know, and the failure to deal with some of these issues is tomorrow's historical trauma, basically. You know, we're all in a position where we can look backward and go, okay, here's the historical trauma for these different cultures. Well, the truth of the matter is, much of what we're doing today is tomorrow's historical trauma. And we are equally, if not more, responsible for today's issues. And so we have to start paying attention to that because we're sort of creating these issues by not paying attention to them and by not looking at them, and by not working out how you put them into a system and how you work through that system. And, you know, I want, I'm just giving you a whole series of examples so you can think about it in your own field, you know, and how, how are you going to do that? How are you going to change your approach to your, your working model? And historical trauma is a good, a good one to, to look at in, in terms of that. Because a lot of people go, okay, well, historical trauma has this presentation and it causes these problems today. Well, human beings being what they are, that isn't enough. What you have to do is say, okay, here's the historical trauma of Northern California for tribal people. One is the Indian Slave Act, okay? One is the boarding schools and one were the multiple massacres. And the massacres, there were more massacres in California than there were in any other state. And, and obviously, some people survived those mass massacres and some did not. Well, in each of those incidences, there's a trickle-down effect. So the Slave Act, let's just look at that one. There were a number of, of people taken as slaves. And primarily, those that were taken were children. Because children, obviously, are easier to handle uh, in that marketplace. And they were taken, put into servitude in a great distance. And a lot of the people who were taken were taken from the north and then taken to uh, Central California or Southern California. 
and the issue about one of the sort of uh, issues of slavery at that point was there were a lot of, of the slaves that were taken ended up not being very good slaves in terms of they all ran home when they were old enough. The problem is that when they ran home, a couple of things happened. First of all, that a lot of the slaves that were taken, there's not um, too many people who can be taken out of a home away from, um, say, their mother, who is usually the person in the home when they're that young, without the mother being killed. So those slaves got to one, see their mother killed, and two, got to be raised as a slave. Now, the problem with that, there, obviously there's many problems with that, but one of the problems with that is that you do not learn how to parent. And because one of the things um, that is pretty much taught in general by modeling is parenting. And if you are parented as a slave, you don't get to learn that. And so that skill, I, you don't have it, you know? So then you, you come forward a couple of generations and you go, you know, you're sitting around as social workers and you say, oh my goodness, these people, they don't know, you know, they don't know how to raise their kids, they're horrible parents, they're this, they're that. But one of the things that you have to do is you have to be aware of what the historical trauma was in each of those communities. And then you have to specifically say to them, have you ever asked the oldest people in your family whether they had any involvement in any of these three things? Because if they did, that helps them figure out how they got to where they are today. You know, when we, we decided we were gonna work with domestic violence because we looked at the local jails and one of the issues with, with the data in the local jails is that they did not want to give it to us in terms of identifying people by tribes. So we had to manually look at every jail list every day for a period of time till we could figure out who was in there. And we figured out, okay, there's a lot of Europe people who are in there for domestic violence. All right, so how did that happen? Because 200 years ago, we didn't have domestic violence. How did that get into the culture? You know, and so one of the things that we said to people was, we want you to go home and ask the oldest people in your family who are, who are still living, if any of these things ever happened in family, if they were you know, present at a massacre, did they survive a massacre? Did their parents go to boarding school? Did their parents or their grandparents, were they slaves? Now, when I was young, which we, we don't need to talk about in terms of how long ago that was, there were still people living who had grown up as slaves. So for California, that's not that far back. You know, and you say to them, okay, this happened to you and then this comes forward, and now you're doing this behavior that the culture never would have supported and did not support and never had in it. Now we want you to try to get past that and go back to the practices, to your value system, which would not have allowed that. And that creates a context for people to make a change. So you have to put what you're learning into effect and impact, but it has to be personalized. It can't be, oh, well, there's, you know, historical trauma. Well, no, it's not like that. It has to be very specific. It has to be what happened in this family. How did this play out in this family? How did this happen? And create a context and create a value system, you know, and look at the different value systems and look at how, what the trickle down effect is. And sort of the, a, a modern version of that is the whole uh, opioid, opioid litigation efforts that people are making. You know, if you look at that, um, one of the things that the tribe did, because we're involved in a lawsuit against the big pharma companies, is look at what the rates of prescription were for our zip codes so that we could tell how much of these drugs were being pumped into our communities. And I'll, I'll just remind you, if you don't know it, that most of those were brought in by the medical professionals. 
And they were sort of, um, in many ways, frankly, tricked into it by the big pharma companies. And during the course of the litigation, we found out that they were having like board meetings talking about basically that their efforts to turn people into addicts were sort of like collateral damage, you know, to them making money. And you go, wait, how can that, how can that be? You know, is it really okay? Is this, this a value of our criminal justice system that those people who sold those drugs, who knew they were making people into addicts and who eventually knew they were killing people and kept on doing it, that's not even an infraction. But if you or I decided to go out, you know, and stand on the corner in Arcata and sell drugs, we could go to jail for a very long time. So how did these two things not quite work out in terms of values and consequences? That's not okay, you know, and we need to look at those systems and go, you know, that, that has to stop. Now, in terms of what the damage has caused, you know, and all the addicts that we have now that we have to deal with, part of what we have to tell them is, look, this is not your fault, you know, this happened, but it's now your responsibility. We have to help you get past this because if we don't, um, this is going to kill you and we don't, we do not want you to be collateral damage of somebody else's bad value judgments and their desire to make money because I, from what I can tell, that's the only thing that was really driving this whole effort, you know, and, and continues to drive it. And so as you, you know, as you kind of work through these lawsuits and you see them, they're perfectly willing to do things like, okay, we'll throw money at this, but we won't, we won't sign a responsibility statement. We won't say we were responsible for killing all these people, you know, because that's, that's not what we do. But as far as give up a few billions, okay, whatever, you know, that, that reduces the billions they have. Um, and those are, are societal value systems in clash in my mind. And part of what we need to look at is what kind of value systems do we want to move forward with? You know, and the, the I guess the, the processing of that in your education, how you learn it, how you're gonna choose that, and then what kinds of practices you develop. Because each of you is in school essentially to gain knowledge and skills to develop practices. You know, and those are often defined by the education system as saying, okay, this is how you're gonna do this for each of these fields. You know, and what you have to do is sort of think back and reawaken in yourself what, what practices would make this work for our values, for the values that we want, for the values that we want in our communities. And if you look at, you know, you're, you're going to a university that is essentially in a rural area and service delivery systems need to be revisited and recreated in these in these areas so that they actually serve the people, you know, and that that's not happening either. You know, so we're looking at serving and being in partner with our neighbors to try to, to create um, a relationship between our communities. You know, we were never, um, in the beginning, we were um, friendly and accepting of people who came here. And then after the trouble started, after the invasion, after people came after, you know, lusting after gold, salmon, and logging, things changed, you know, but we can change again. We have the, the power to do that. And I think we need to do that, um, you know, and that's the kind of thing we have a choice to do. And, you know, that's what I'm saying to you is look at your choices and look at how you do it. And be mindful. I mean, it's good, you know, to, to learn all these things and learn how you do it. Um, but keep in mind that's one system of how you do it. It isn't necessarily the only way to do it. And that's, that I guess is what I'm telling you is to look at designing practices 
that are really in keeping with your value system, you know, and go, okay, this is how we're going to do it, you know, and if you're a social worker, go, I am going to be in community and people, like when I came home, people said, oh, well, you can't be the judge because you know these people, you know, and you know me and I'm like, oh my God, we all grew up together. Of course I know you, you know, and, but look about it, think about it because it's true. When I was a state court judge, if people came into the courtroom who I knew, I could not be their judge, right? But in a village society, I could be a person who helped them come to a resolution. Those are two different systems. One is justice by strangers and one is not. You know, we live for thousands of years in villages as did many other cultures. And were we so uh, whatever that we never had disputes? Trust me, we had disputes. So how did we resolve them? Well, we seem to have forgotten about that. One, that we had disputes, and two, that we resolved them. So what we have to go is go, wait a second, how could we possibly resolve this? How is that going to happen? And how do we do that? And then have enough confidence in ourselves to say, okay, we're going to devise a system that allows us to do that. If it worked for, you know, 10,000 years, and it, we haven't used it for the last couple of hundred, we could probably go back to it. You know, and that's not a bad thing. You know, and that's the kind of way you have to think through problem solving. Because basically, education is about, in my mind, problem solving. You know, and how do you do that? How do you get the information? How do you process it? And how do you work it through so that it actually works for you and works for the people that you want to work with and you want to live with? You know, and it's, you can't change everything but you can change your own little corner of the world by what you do, how you model it, and how you work towards solutions. And the whole thing about education in my mind is, okay, how is this gonna help me come to a solution? And why was it done that way? Um, and a good example is even this, the, what we're doing now, even though it's virtual, and like I said, I would have preferred to be able to, to see you and, you know, to interact and have questions during the course of this. But I read, oh, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago, I was, maybe more actually, I was reading transcripts of speeches that had been given by um, other tribal people uh, at different junctures. And I realized that the construct of how they were talking and what they were saying was much different than what I had been taught to do, you know, in terms of public speaking. So I thought, wait a minute, you know, maybe I'm going to stop doing what I was taught and I'm going to go back to doing it their way. And that's what I'm doing now is going, okay, when I get ready to deliver any kind of speech or address or to try to have a talk, what I do is I put myself in the same position they would put themselves in and I think through how I'm going to do it. But it's a whole different approach than what I was taught in school. And we have the option to do that. And I'm not saying you reject it all because, you know, obviously some parts of it I'm using, you know, but it also is, it's on you to figure out what parts and how do you do that? And how do you change it? And how do you articulate, okay, this is different. You know, I'm not going to go back to this system. I'm going to use this, this other system um, of how they spoke. And I noticed in their speech patterns that they were much more centered, much more uh, empathetic and able to speak in that way because they weren't, they didn't decide beforehand, okay, this is everything that you need to know, you know, instead it was like, okay, what, what do I think people want to know from me and what could I tell them that would be helpful? And it's more of a conversation and it's more of a, the preparation is very different than what I used to do. And in some ways it's more preparation 
because you have to hold more in, in your mind to, to be able to do it. But it changes how you present yourself and what words you use and how you address people. You know, and I noticed that um, for me, it works better. You know, so you have to you have to figure out what that is. And you also have to figure out, okay, at, at what points, um, even though you're in this whatever system you're in, am I going to go, you know what, I'm not going to do that. Whatever the rule is here, I'm not going to do it for this reason. And you have to know when you can step back and when you can't. I'll give you another example. I was on the bench and I had this 11-year-old um, young man come in front of me and he had been in a fight this was a monday morning arraignment because i was in juvenile court at that point and he had been in a fight at school and he'd spent the entire weekend locked up in the san francisco juvenile detention and his parents were out there and, and all his uncles and he was obviously terrified he came up I mean, they they did the first part of the hearing. I did the first part of the hearing. And I called the lawyers up and I said to the district attorney, what in God's name are you thinking of? Because they had charged him with some fairly serious things and there weren't, there was no injuries, you know, involved in this. This was a, a schoolyard scuffle basically. And the district attorney starts going on and on. And I said, you know, this is not gonna happen not in this court. I said, the truth of the matter is people don't get charged with felonies if they're not tall enough to ride the teacup rides in Disneyland, not in this court. I said, so step back. At which point I said, you know, I'm going to, to the, to the child, I'm releasing you to your father and your uncles. They have to take off work to come here to get you today. They're very worried about you. And they have managed to grow up, be in the world and have jobs and not be locked up. So the next time you get a really stupid idea, I suggest you step back and call one of them because they obviously know what to do to avoid this kind of trouble. Now you go home, your lawyer will be in contact with you and with any luck at all, you and I will never see each other again. You know, and at some points you have to do things like that regardless of what is the rule, you know, and that creates, uh, you do have, you have to know obviously where you have discretion, where you don't, but that's the kind of thing. And, you know, and at one point they said, well, we're, you know, you can't do that. I said, well, that's what the appellate courts are for, you know, take your best shot at which point they went back and thought about it and they didn't do it because it was one of those things that it was just overreaching and you have to go, you know, that's, that's not okay. Um, and when it's not okay, you can't be part of it. That's, that's about it. Um, so that's, you know, that's something you have to think through too, is how do you, how do you stop that? Um, when, when it's in there and it, sort of the weight of the system is crushing you and crushing everybody else to move forward. And you have to figure out different ways, you know, in each of your professions. I want to talk a little bit about the arts for a minute. Um, we had a few years ago a, um, a cluster of suicides. And one of the things that we wanted to do was an art project to try to help people articulate some of the issues that they were facing. And so I reached out to um, an artist whose name is Claudia Bernardi. And she had come from um, Latin American country and had specialized as an artist uh, going into villages that had suffered massacres and doing murals after the massacres. Um, and her sister was a forensic um, archeologist and I said, you know, this is what we want to do. And we had had several exchanges back and forth over email. And so I said, you know, I have this problem and I think it might help if we could do something around um, our issues that was art related and let people speak that way through an art project. And 
she said, oh, I, you know, I could do that. I could do that. And I had never really seen her. And so we got all the stuff together and she came up and um, I was basically, um, I was so surprised at how well she worked in community. We had a group of maybe 10 or 15 um, young kids, parents, siblings of people who had suffered this loss. They created four panels that were about 10 feet by six feet of beautiful art that the kids did themselves and the young people did themselves that showed people who were committing suicide, showed one panel showed uh, a meeting of, a supposed meeting, I guess you would say, and they were all empty chairs with nobody in the chairs. And it, they said it was an, an AA meeting but nobody ever goes, you know? And so they did all of this and they did it in three days and it's a beautiful piece of work and it really helped them and helped with the recovery in the community. So, and I'm saying that she's gone on and she's gonna come back and do some work with us around um, the murdered and missing women. And we have a project set up for the fall to do that. But right now she sent me this this discussion of a project, which was she was working with the kids who were interned at the border um, away from their parents. And she devised a way to do it virtually because I thought there's no way you can do virtual art. You know, I mean, come on. Well, there apparently is. And she figured it out. She had these kids with the people who um, were in charge of them. The kids would lay down on the floor on the um, canvases and they would trace the outline of themselves and then they would do art of themselves. They would draw within themselves and around themselves. And it is a remarkable piece of art, the mural that she created with them. And they did a sort of evaluation and talked to the kids afterwards about you know, what this meant to them and how much it meant to them which was a tremendous amount. And one of the most sort of compelling statements was they were pressing this boy who had come, you know, basically hundreds of miles, was separated from his family and was really suffering. And they said, well, what would you like to say about this or what can you say about it? And he thought for a while and he said, you know, what I wanna say to, to Miss Claudia is that something I haven't said in a very long time and I want to say thank you. You know, and you go, oh my God, you know. So that way of working, that way of expression, that way of reaching out, you know, in these difficult situations, and it just shows that every, every one of us, no matter what our profession is going to be, has an opportunity to do that if we put ourselves in that place to do it. You know, and how do you do that? How do you make that happen? You know, uh, for this young person to be able to say that and for him to be able to feel that, how long was it since he felt that and he could say that? How much did he go through to reach that point? You know, and that's the kind of thing where you go, you know, Without her and without her work, she teaches at a university now, we could not have had that for him, you know? Um, and that's, that's amazing, you know? And that help that we can create and that environment that we can create, that, that you can create, you know? And that's what I'm saying to you is, use this time to think through things and to prepare yourself. You know, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot that remains undone and that needs to be done. Um, and there's a different way of doing it than maybe what, what you're learning. Uh, and you know a lot of things and I want you to remember those things and I want you to be able to express them and to create these systems for doing it. You know, and how, how do we do that? And how are we responsible to each other for doing that? You know, because it isn't just one group that has had this issue or that issue or whatever. 
you know, we, we need to have a different way of relating to each other and being responsible for each other. And that's what I'm trying to say is that we have a responsibility for each other. You know, it isn't just, okay, well, I'm only responsible to your ox. No, that's not true. You know, um, and we're responsible to a lot of things and for a lot of things. And, and so are you. And you can do it. Um, you know, and we're looking towards you to do that. And we're hoping that you will develop those practices and think through those things. And like with Claudia, you know, she, she and her sister basically raised themselves in a very difficult situation. And out of that brought this, you know, brought this artwork, brought this caring and reaching out to people and helping so many people, you know, in a way, I mean, I would have never thought of that. You know, when people said, oh, well, she can do a virtual mural, I was thinking, yeah, like what? You know, but I, that's because I don't know anything about art. I mean, if the truth were out, you know, so we each have gifts and we each have purposes. We come here with a purpose and part of being in, in this time and part of teaching and learning what you're learning is you're, you're looking for your purpose and how you're going to to exercise that purpose and bring that purpose into the world, you know, and it's, it's bigger than each of us individually. We have to go, okay, what, what is it and how do we do it and how are we going to do it? You know, and you look at law and you go, well, what's very interesting about the law? Not, not a lot in particular, but there are a lot of people who are involved with it and you look at it and you go, this was supposed to be a fair system. And the more time you spend around it, the more you go, you know, it, it really isn't very fair. And what do, we knew, what do we need to do to change it? Because it is our system, you know, and a lot of people just ignore it until they're swept up into it or somebody else is swept up into it that they're, you know, that they know or they're close to. And then you go, oh, my goodness, you know, we should have looked at this or we should have changed this, you know, and we get caught in this is the way it's done and not thinking about, wait a second, maybe that's not a good way to do it. Maybe we should do it a different way. Maybe we can think through the problem in a different fashion. Maybe we can write about it in a different fashion. Maybe we can resolve these issues in a different fashion. And that's what I'm looking you know, toward you to do is to go, you know, we, we need a, a, I don't know whether you wanna say a better way, but a different way and we need some choices and we need better results. So in that way, it is, it is a different way and a better way. You know, it is not okay for the number of, of children in this country that we have that go to bed hungry at night when we have all of this wealth and all of this. It's not right. You know, and the purpose of being grown-ups is to make sure that we do what is right to the people around us, to, to the children, to the elders, that's our responsibility. You know, that's your responsibility. And it's something that we have to, we have to meet because that's the job of, of being humans. Um, so hopefully, you know, that, that will happen and you'll be able to do that. And, and you'll think about that. You know, in each of your professions, think about how, how am I going to do that? How am I going to make this a part of, of everybody's sort of everyday how we do things, knowing that we have to be responsible? And that includes, you know, toward our environment, you know, and the climate. And it isn't about just taking, grabbing and running. You know, that's, that's not right behavior. And we have to say to each other when we do that, have I ever, you know, done wrong? Of course I have, you know, and you have to look at yourself and go, you know, it's up to each of us to look at ourselves and to help each other and to, to relate in a family way of going, this is a better way of doing it. This is what I want to do. This is how I want to do it. And, you know, when I changed how I decided I was going to do uh, public speaking and that kind of thing, I did it because I thought it would be a better way of, of connecting with people. 
you know, and the point of, of public speaking to me is to connect with people so that you want to be able to do that. And a lot of things happen in that, in that way. You look at what you're doing and you go, okay, this can, you can do this better. And, you know, Claudia was, for me, is a really good example of that. And other people who do other kinds of work or who say, okay, I'm going to be a social worker. And basically what I tell our workers and our advocates is culturally for us, a lot of the sort of structure and discipline of, of families was carried out by aunts and uncles. So I say to them, okay, I'm really glad you went to school, but if you're out in the field and you're trying to figure out what to do, just do whatever you would do as an aunt or an uncle, because that's what you need to do. You know, you need to do this and you need to convey this and you need to help. And at the end of the day, that's what you want to do. So you need to be comfortable in your culture and you need to be comfortable in your civic life to be able to do that, you know, and to say, this is how it's, how it should be done and how I'm going to do it so that we can get the results that we want. And the results that we want is a more, more harmony in community and more shared values so that when we move forward, uh, we can help each other and make sure that everyone is taken care of and not just the humans that are in there, but the, the environment, the wildlife and the things that we've been given, you know, we talk about for, for us, you know, for the Yurox, we have a beautiful homeland and it's, uh, it has given us a lot and we need uh, to be responsible toward it. You know, we can't just take and take and take. That's not, that's not how it's supposed to be. We have a reciprocal arrangement and responsibility and relationship. And that's what, you know, you're trying to get, get people to, to look at. Um, so I guess at this point, I just want to thank people for uh, being attentive and um, hopefully when this, whatever we're in the middle of right now, um, gets over, there maybe will come a time when we can sit down and talk and uh, I would look forward to that. I, I would take questions if people had questions. Okay, thank you so much, Abby. If if we could hear the whole crowd, I'm sure they would all be applauding right now. <laughs> um, but we do have a couple of questions that have come into the, the q and I I want to remind everybody, if you have a question, please feel free to click on that Q&A button and submit it there. Um, but there was a couple of early ones I want to touch on. Um, so uh, from Sherman Shapiro, uh, the story you were telling about the, the young boy who, who couldn't fit in the teacups and um, the, his, his family came to pick him up. Um, Sherman was asking at that time, did the DA accept that decision that you had offered? Yes, they did. Because I said, you know, that you need to rethink this. And it's sort of like rethinking the whole thing of uh, police officers in schools. You know, I said, I don't know what this boy did or what brought this boy to that. That's up to you all to figure out and to help resolve but I am not turning an 11 year old into a felon for a schoolyard fight. It's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, wonderful. Go somewhere else. Yeah. That's okay. awesome. Um, the judge, you know, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then also from Sherman Shapiro, I think it was when you were talking about the art project, mm -hmm. um, he was curious about how, how old were the children? They were, um, different ages, teenagers to, I would say, eight years old, maybe might have been the youngest, okay. but they had all been involved in the community that had suffered the loss. That's how they, and it was a camp experience. So we provided a camp arrangement, and then uh, Claudia was at the camp. They had shared meals, and then they shared the artwork, and they conceptualized it together, and she would give them art lessons but all of the mural, and it, it currently uh, hangs in our entryway to our main administrative building, was done by the kids and the, and the family members. So it was all non-artist kinds of things. So they had, part of it was the uh, issues of suicide and part of it was the strength of the culture 
in different panels, you know, and that's what they wanted to do. And it was really amazing. Sure. Thank you. A, a couple more questions have come in. Um, way back in the beginning, um, Emily Kratzer, she says she's a 1976 alum, said, thanks for your perspective. Can you talk a little bit about restorative justice? I think as you're, th that got answered. <laughs> Unless you have anything else you want to add. I think restorative justice is what, you know, a lot of people are calling this sort of old style um, relationship building. And basically it's, you know, when people come into my courtroom and they'll, you, they get an opportunity to have a trial if they want a trial, or they get an opportunity to make this right. You know, and I will say to them, do you want to make this right? Do you want to talk to me? And do you want to figure out a solution or do you want a trial? And probably nine out of 10 go out. I want to talk to you about it and see what we can do. You know, and sometimes I'll have them go out and mediate um, with somebody like with a cultural leader or mediate with one of our uh, mediators or just say, well, you know, you messed up. How are you going to fix this? How are you going to make this right? So you can walk out of here knowing that you fixed it, you know, because you made a mistake and everybody makes them. So let's figure out how to resolve it. Sure, you know? sure. And it's not up to me to prove you did it. You know, if you did it or not, just tell me, you know, um, and then we'll, then we'll fix it. I will help you fix it, you know. Um, and, you know, I had a kid ask me one time, well, you know, over at the end of a dispute, he said, uh, I said, well, this is what we're going to do then. You don't have the money to do this, but why don't you, you now owe a big fine. Why don't you take fish to the dance on Saturday? And if you do it, I'll forgive your fine and I'll give you back all your stuff. And he's like, okay, well, how will you know I'll do it? And I said, well, you're in here because you weren't smart enough to charge your phone and therefore didn't have an alarm and left your net in past the date or past the time and you got fined. So you're not in here because you're a liar. You're in here because you didn't charge your phone. So I assume if you tell me, you're going to do it. Not to mention which I will be at the dance. So I'll know if you don't do it. And that would not be really pleasant for you. And he said, okay, I just was wondering. I said, no, it's, fine. <laughs> it's good to wonder. <laughs> wondering is good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we had, um, let's see, there's another question here from Sandra Lowry. I'll read it to you. It says, Judge Abby, I'm proud for you. I'm proud of you for being so articulate, knowledgeable, and brave to take on a new paradigm that I call progression to backwards. As another Yurok tribal member, I always knew our philosophies and values were truly people-centered, but you helped others learn more about us. I have a question for those who currently try to help people in these troubled areas. What if this works? Well, I think that it will work and I think it will work cross-culturally because I think that even the people who sort of in many ways jumped into the melting pot, they have a culture and they have a memory and they don't sometimes realize it's a cultural memory. It's just like when you say to Eurox, would you rather have a trial or do you want to make this right? Many of them don't go, I'm going to make the cultural choice. I'd rather make it right. Many of them go with what they think is their personal preference. You know, so many, many people have that inside them, which is actually their cultural memory. Okay. A couple more here. They're, everyone's thinking and sending you questions. This one is from Keith Brennan. Um, he says, my sister is in her first semester of environmental law degree. What advice would you say to a new law student on her path to helping to protect the environment? Uh, that it's a lot of hard work. And the more she can align herself with the environment, the easier her path will be. It's, you know, it's the kind of thing where they try to force her into quantification as opposed to her alignment with the environment. And she really needs to align with the environment and keep strong in that because what she's doing is aligning with a relative, you know, and they need her and expect her to do this and want her to do this. So she has more on her side than she might think you know, that they're living things too, and they will support her to do this and to help them. Okay. 
Um, this one is from Barbara. I'm going to say her na last name wrong. I'm sorry. Bor Borger, maybe. Um, she says, I work in juvenile justice in Humboldt County. And over the years, we've improved our assessment tools so that someone like your 11-year-old who would not come into custody. Um, but at the same time, we don't always know what community resources are available for Native youth. Who can we reach out to to connect with the wellness courts? Well, we're trying to, at this point, trying to do MOUs with both Humboldt and Del Norte and to do new projects around um, schools and education so that we can offer more services. And we have youth workers now at the tribe, you know, and if um, you can contact, um, we have two and we're hiring two more uh, that we got funded to do. And it really is about trying to do programs together. Um, and sometimes, and we have, finances available for inpatient if we need it um, and to try to align but I'm really trying to concentrate we have the highest dropout rate of any uh, race in elementary school and frankly that's not acceptable mm -hmm. so we have to work through some of these issues you know and the best thing for her to do would, would be to reach out to our staff uh, here at the court um, and you know you can do that by we have um, of course I don't know how to do it but she probably does get on the web and <laughs> they have all of our staff and their emails and that's the that's the best way to do it okay thank you um, this one is, so uh, Carrie Raphael asked if you were involved with the Anna Devere Smith pipeline project have you heard of that project yes I was and yes I've heard of it and um, they, they did a lot of work up here and she did a play in New York that was very well received and featured our tribe. And also there was a PBS rendition of it. Um, and we ha I have worked with her and I have uh, talked with her about the project a, a lot. And it, was, it was interesting you know, to have somebody come up and do it. And so we try to reach out to the arts to, to do that kind of thing. Um, and she came up here seeking to put us into that dynamic and in the end decided to do that. And so um, it was interesting to go to New York and sit in a theater and, and to see us portrayed on, on the stage. So I would imagine so, yeah. Um, okay, next question is from Craig uh, Herber. What are your thoughts on the protests going on in many cities and the co-opt of peaceful messaging by those that resort to violence or property destruction? Um, you know, I don't know how to stop the, the violence. I, I really don't. Um, I think that all we can do is continue to try to peacefully make our point that the violence that occurs is not acceptable to us in community uh, and not become violent ourselves. And that's what's hard. You know, um, I have a temper like everybody else, you know, and you get pushed and you get pushed and then sometimes you go whatever. And then some people just are proponents of violence. You know, I'm not. Um, and I don't think um, it's something that, the, that I would support. You know, I don't support it. I support peaceful alliances with each other to resolve these problems for all of us. You know, we are, we're going to, we're going to go forward together or drown together. And that's about it. You know, it's not going to be, okay, well, we're going to be above you and you guys are going to sink. You know what, if we sink, you're coming with us. So, um, you know, it's, it's one for all and one for one. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have one here from Ruby and she says, uh, it sounds like when one has to reach a certain role to make significant change in incorporating value-based practice changes that you touched on throughout your eloquent speech, do you have any recommendations for people, frontline workers working within the rigid systems to incorporate the changes you spoke about today? I think you have to do it on an everyday basis. You know, um, 
let me just say being, you know, the opportunities are there and you have to model it and you have to decide what you, what your own value system is. You know, being the first Native American woman attorney in this state, I had a lot of encounters with very unpleasant situations and I had a decision to make about how I was going to respond to that. I mean, I had judges say to me, oh, you can't be a lawyer, you're an Indian. I had people spit on me. I had people shove me. I had people say, you can't sit up here with the, you know, this is only for lawyers. I had all of that. And you, you have to say, you know what, this isn't about me. If I get myself thrown out of here, then the person that I'm here, the tribal person that I'm here for, then they're all alone. They don't have me. And they've already done that. You know, and even, you know, I lost a lot of cases. You know, it wasn't like I was, uh, you know, I'm not brilliant. Um, and, but being there was important, you know, and doing the best you can in a situation because then more came. And frankly, the people who came behind me are smarter than me. And that's what you're hoping for. <laughs> you know, is that they come. You have to, you have to do that and you have to push against it, you know, because maybe, you know, my pushing against it meant that some of these other people wouldn't have to suffer that level of abuse, you know, and you got to align with people who you were comfortable with, you know, and who, but for you wouldn't have had anybody, you know, and that's a pretty lonely situation for them. Absolutely. Um, Let's see, another question that just came in. This is a good one. Any recommendations for books to read? Oh, wow. Well, you know, I, I have actually a used bookstore here. That's the other, one of my other things. Um, and I read somewhere between 80 to 100 books a year. Wow. So, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a habit. I never learned how to turn on the TV. I think if you didn't grow up with it, you, yep. you don't. Now they're so complicated. I mean, in the last month or so, I, I read Cast, which I think is very important. I read Hood Feminism. I read Memorial Drive. I'm reading a, a memoir of a, a African-American woman who grew up in um, by Travis Air Force Base. Her father was in the Air Force. Um, so I just, I read a lot of books um, that are nonfiction. You know, so any of those are, are good ones. Um, trying to think of, you know, I thought cast was, was very important. Um, and I liked how, you know, basically they said that race wasn't, race was a concept that this country invented. There was no race discussion before there was this country. And that's interesting in itself you know, and she pretty well proved her point. So I, I, you know, it's, it's well worth reading and digesting that argument, you know, I'm still thinking about it and there's a lot of stuff. And I, I like Benjamin Madley's book, um, you know, what's, um, i trying to think of the name of it. Um, I thought his is one of the better books on the, on the native experience in California and it goes through everything. So. Oh, are you getting a question to you? <laughs> I have, we have about three more here. Mm -hmm. um, can you say any more about the missing and murdered indigenous women? And then she says, thank you for all of it. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, we just issued a, a report after a first year of a project that we're doing. And one of the project, the pro point of the project for us was to create a data system that people could use, other tribes could use. And we've had a couple of interviews with other tribes who are now taking that material. And we really, really want this to be used across the country uh, in tribal communities and also to, to seek for solutions you know, and to go, okay, this has got to stop. This is not okay. And how did we get here? And how are we going to put an end to this? You know, and uh, we're spending a lot of time and energy on that and developing protocols. You know, and if we have 
different protocols and we're looking at them and then we have to to look at ourselves and go what are we going to do to stop this and what are we going to ask other systems to do to stop it and to me that's how you make systemic change so that's what i'm looking at in those you know and the report's a public report if anybody you know wants it they can ask um ask us for it and we'll be happy to send it to them so and it's available online it's on our um internet or web web stuff or what i can't I don't know anything about that stuff, but it's available. <laughs> I should probably on the interweb where they can find it. <laughs> okay, so there's there's three more questions, and then we'll we'll kind of cut off the Q and A time. So, um, what are your thoughts on milita militarized police confronting protesters who are still protesting peacefully? Very similar to nuking somebody. I don't think it's a really great idea. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say that it's just, uh, it's like clubbing somebody. There's no real reason for it. Sure. Thank you. This one comes from Laurel. Um, thank you for your wisdom and sharing it with us. I have long wanted to be involved in the preservation and promotion of traditional ecological knowledge, language preservation and healing of trauma. I'm a white European American woman and I've not tried to get involved due to a concern that I won't be welcome and that I'll be intrusive. Do you have any advice on how someone like me could be of service without being intrusive and perpetuating colonial damage? We all come into this world with pluses and negatives, you know, and if you want to work in a field, I think you approach the people in the field and you and you give it your best shot. Um, and are, are people going to say this or that or whatever? I mean, you know, there's a lot of criticism out there. But if you want to work in it, I think you learn what you can and you, you look to uh, alliances, you know, and there's, there's lots of, I mean, for instance, um, trafficked children. You know, a lot of different races are involved in that. High rates of, of children of color high and, and poor whites. You know, there's lots of areas. You just have to decide where can you make the, the most impact? Where do you have the most empathy for? What can you do? And the whole thing of, well, um, you know, and you have to also, I mean, part of it is reaching out, being friends, you know, with people and, and walking with them. You walk with people. You don't lead them. You don't follow them. You walk with them. You know, and, and that's the difference, I think. You know, and all of us. I mean, I don't know the answer either. So it's not like I'm keeping it back from anybody. If I if I had the answer, I'd give it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and here's here's our last one, and kind of ties us back to Humboldt a little bit more. We all we all have um. You, you and I, we share the, the Humboldt experience at different times. Um, and this person is asking, um, what would you like to see changed at Humboldt, if anything? You know, I don't, I don't know that I really have an answer to that because I haven't really followed it well enough. I, w I want people to be successful there. I want students to be supported. I, you know, I, I'm happy with the issues to like help students who are struggling with food issues, meaning that they don't have enough financial support to do that. You know, I think we need to support them more to do that. Uh, it's going to school is hard, you know, and, and it's work and it, and, you know, we need to help people do that uh, and to, and to provide for people and make sure that you know, it's not okay to be doing the work during the day of, of studying and go to bed hungry. It's, it's not in my mind, you know, and to be able to, to reach out and make sure those things happen, you know, and the community needs to do that and, and we need to do more of it, you know, and, and as far as what to change, I mean, I, I would like to see a, more in education in general. I'd like to see more apprenticeship work. I'd like to see more inter internship work. I'd like to see more partnering with some of the faculty to provide some services in community, you know, those kinds of things, because it's really hard. Like I said, the whole 
service delivery model for rural communities is out of whack. You know, and one of the points where professionals um, congregate is in universities, you know, and if they could be given part of their time to work in community, that would be really helpful. Sure. You know, so just to say, okay, well, if we have a wellness village and then we have a nurse in that village, or, you know, when you get law enforcement screaming and crying for, we need a SART nurse for violence victims and we don't have one, you know, uh, di different things like that, you mm -hmm. know, where you go, okay, here's a place where we can maybe work out an agreement to do that. If, you know, if the school could be designed, redesigned to provide some services locally, you know, of, of that, that nature internship programs, more opportunities for kids to go there and, and you know, to learn things um, and to make it something that, that is available to them, you know, to other people. Yeah. I know I said last question, but now I really mean it because a good one just popped in. <laughs> so Judge Abby, why would you choose, this is from Sarai or Sarah, Sarai, um, why would you choose to initially pursue a degree, a journalism degree from HSU and did it impact or influence any paths you've taken throughout your career? I think that the, the really good thing I learned from that, frankly, was um, I learned how to write and I did not have great writing skills and that really, really helped me. Wow. Um, and, it, and it gave me discipline you know, because journalism is a very disciplined field. Um, you know, you have deadlines, you have that. And I was able to, I got a lot out of that, but the writing is what I really got out of it was the ability to do that, you know, to write. Okay. And, you know, say I can, I can read and write and I, I can do just about nothing else. So <laughs> <laughs> if the I, <laughs> I think you can do a lot more than that. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> well, Judge Abby, we are just so, so honored that you were able to join us and connect with everyone. And thank you to the audience for submitting all your questions and interacting with Abby. I know that is a, um, it's nice. It's nice to have everyone attending and everyone paying attention and wanting to contribute. So I do want to remind the crowd before we end that Distinguished Alumni Awards, um, we depend on you to nominate the fabulous alumni that come from Humboldt State and um, amplify where they're at in their career. So if you know someone as fabulous as Abby, or Abby, if you know someone, <laughs> please feel free to use those reading and writing skills and <laughs> submit a nomination. So we take nominations all year round and they're, they're due in January, uh, the beginning of January of every year. So um, we are so grateful to the folks who nominated you, Abby, and um, we're able to, to get you to this point, and we're grateful for your time, um, and you're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but lots of people are thanking you for your time and your perspective, and um, we are just really grateful, and um, just so everyone knows, I think I mentioned it in the beginning, but the webinar is being recorded, and we'll get it up on the alumni website, and then also on the HSU YouTube channel, so. Okay, great. Thank you. Abby, thank you so much, and thank you to everyone who came. Bye-bye. <laughs>